1963, in Covine, California, just outside Los Angeles, a young 17-year-old teenager named Linda Porter would be abducted by aliens. Linda would continue to be abducted over the years, and after years of experiences, she decided to reach out to journalist Linda Moulton Howe at age 45. Her bizarre experiences and claims have gotten much attention as Linda Porter would be one of the first individuals to document the terrifying praying mantis alien. In today's episode, we will examine the abductions of Linda Porter as well as the frightening claims she made regarding the motivations of the beings. On the terrifying first abduction in 1963, Linda remembers waking up to a blinding lights and strange sounds. Somewhat confused, she sat up and was soon guided by a small gray alien into a larger room. There, she would encounter a terrifying eight-foot-tall being that looked like a praying mantis. According to Linda, the being was in charge and seemed very intelligent. The being knew how frightening it was to Linda, and it gave her the impression that it was old. While gray aliens are typically associated with abduction cases, cases with praying mantis aliens are much more rare. In 1988, Linda Porter reached out to Linda Moulton Howe regarding her experiences. Moulton Howe would document the experience of Linda in the book Glimpses of Other Realities. While the encounter with the praying mantis alien was surely terrifying, perhaps what Porter said about their goal in the abductions was most frightening. According to Porter, the aliens were interested in the human soul. They had been studying it, but couldn't figure out what it was and where it went after a person died. Porter states she witnessed humans in suspended animation in three containers on the craft. The beings seemingly were experimenting with these humans somehow in these tubes. Porter alleges she was part of the experiment as well. Porter suggested that the beings were interested in how humans and life on Earth were evolving. They had manipulated human DNA. Linda Porter has faced criticism over the years. Skeptics say that Linda Porter's accounts are the result of a fascination with science fiction and her imagination. For example, in 1957, a popular monster movie named The Deadly Mantis was released. The movie plot involves a 200-foot praying mantis released from the ice after a volcano explodes. Other movies like Godzilla had insect-like monsters as well. Some say all this led to a fear and somewhat fascination of insects, especially the strange praying mantis. Despite what skeptics say, though, many believe Linda Porter's case did occur. Linda recorded detailed drawings over the years of her experience. In addition, her experience happened before the abduction phenomena really occurred. Moreover, she was one of the first to document the dreadful praying mantis. Linda's case and others has led many to believe that there is some type of alien hierarchy on the bottom are small greys who handle most of the busy work. They are thought to be the least intelligent and disposable. Larger or taller greys are higher up on the food chain. Some believe Nordics are above them and sometimes even in charge. However, others think that the praying mantis aliens are at the very top. Some have suggested they are similar to a queen in a beehive. Generally, there's no consensus at this point as to what exactly the hierarchy is. While Linda Porter's case is certainly a fascinating one, it is also one that seems credible, but unfortunately, downright terrifying. On the night of Saturday, October 21st, 1978, Frederick Valentich was on a 125-mile training flight going over the Bass Strait in Australia, headed toward Kings Island in Tasmania. Valentich 
was piloting a Cessna 182L light aircraft around halfway through his flight at 7.12 p.m. Valentich contacted the Melbourne Air Traffic Control with a series of strange transmissions that would baffle aviation investigators for decades. He reported that something was up in the sky with him, something that Valentich said wasn't an aircraft. After the transmission ended, Valentich was never seen or heard from again. In today's episode, we will examine the strange disappearance of Frederick Valentich and theories regarding what exactly happened to him. To understand the mysteriousness of this case, we must first discuss in more detail the conversation between air traffic control and Valentich in more detail on the night of October 21st, 1978. At 7.12 p.m., Valentich notified the control tower that he was being accompanied by some type of craft about a thousand feet above him. The craft he described had four bright lights in a diamond formation. Valentich also told the air traffic control that his engine was running roughly. The tower notified Valentich that they couldn't see anything on their radar and that no other aircraft was in the vicinity. Air traffic control asked for more details surrounding the situation. Three minutes later at 7.15 p.m., Valentich replied that the aircraft was now hovering above him. It was huge, 300 feet in length, metallic, with a green light and made a strange humming sound. At 7.18 p.m., Valentich switched from a curious state to a frustrated state. The craft was now chasing him and Valentich was attempting to shake it and also stated he was losing control of his aircraft. At 7.21 p.m., Valentich's voice started breaking up. Strange metallic clicking noises could be heard on the transmission, and Valentich indicated the craft was right on top of him and that he was going into the light. It should be stated that before the conversation began, at 7.12 p.m. that night, all transmissions from Valentich indicated he was perfectly fine and under no duress. Before discussing the theories and questions surrounding this event, it's important to discuss the background of Valentich. Frederick Valentich was considered by some to be a poor pilot. He had logged 150 hours of flight time, and he had a Class 4 instrument rating, which allowed him to fly at night, but only when the skies were clear. He had twice applied to the Royal Australia Air Force, but was rejected twice due to his lack of education. Despite this, Valentich aspired to be a pilot. It should also be said Valentich was a flying saucer enthusiast. Many skeptics believe that this influenced his transmissions as he was looking for a flying saucer that wasn't there. For years, many speculated he disappeared and it was all a hoax. This would prove not to be the case when one researcher discovered a key government file in the case. In 2012, Adelaide researcher Keith Basterfield stumbled upon a 315-page report from the government in the National Archives Index. He had been told in 2004 that the file was lost. This file has been considered by many to be the holy grail in the mystery containing much information from the initial investigation. In the file, it contains several important findings. The first finding is that it showed that parts of the aircraft with partial serial numbers were found in the Bass Strait five years after Valentich vanished. The second finding, perhaps more important, was that investigators left open the possibility of a UFO encounter in the open, not something they said publicly. Investigators labeled it an unidentified flying object, and they didn't label this in the media. In the file, the defense minister is asked to look into the matter 
surrounding a UFO. There have been many theories put forth around this incident over the years. The first is that Valentich and his craft were taken by a UFO. It seems that the government report eliminates the possibility that the plane was taken, but the question of whether Valentich was abducted is still unanswered. Still, it's interesting that the government didn't choose to release that part of the plane had been found. There could be multiple reasons for this, but it's reasonable to assume that the UFO talk in the media would have died out. Some speculate that the government didn't actually find the partial part of the plane, and they planted the report in the archives, knowing someone would find it. The transmission itself speaks volumes about what the young pilot was seeing and what was happening to his craft. It's almost certainly not the case that he lied or exaggerated about seeing it, but could Valentich have been mistaken? Some believe so. Skeptics typically point out that Valentich was an inexperienced and often reckless pilot who was obsessed with UFOs. They discuss several things that could have happened to Valentich. One, he could have seen Venus, which that night was shown to be at its very brightest. Mars, Mercury, and the bright star Antares. Some believe the pilot got confused seeing the lights and began to panic. Suggestions include he fell into a graveyard spiral, which is when pilots experience sensory illusions. Others suggest that perhaps the pilot was experiencing some type of medical condition, like a seizure or heart attack, that caused him to see the lights. One interesting story concerns a farmer who alleged to see a Cessna airplane. The morning after Valentich went missing, a story emerged about a farmer who witnessed a Cessna airplane attached to a craft. The farmer supposedly wrote down the airplane registration number and kept the information as a secret due to fear of ridicule. While this is an interesting story, it seems like more of an urban legend, as the farmer was never identified. We will probably never know what happened to Frederick Valentich that night, but regardless, this case remains one of the most controversial and mysterious events in aviation history. On a hot, sticky July afternoon in 1987, Jason Andrews was celebrating his fourth birthday at his family's cottage outside Slade Green in southeast London when the heavens would open. As the thunder crashed all around, there was a single flash of lightning. Suddenly, a stream of numbers started pouring out of Jason's mouth. Fantastic numbers, complex mathematical equations, including advanced algebra and calculus. Up until this point, Jason was a boy who had struggled to count to ten. Seconds later, the windows and doors began to shake violently, and the four-year-old spoke to his mother, father, and elder brother, and stated, They're waiting for me. I have to go. Jason's father, Paul, grabbed his son and tried to stop him from walking out into the pouring rain. But Jason struggled and shook violently as if something was trying to pull him out. As this was occurring, the house would shake and the family was generally fearful the home could collapse. Finally, Jason seemed to wake from his trance and the shaking of the house stopped. At that point, the family knew that Jason was no ordinary boy. The following eight years that followed, Strange events would continue to occur, and the parents would be perplexed around these events. In 1995, when Jason was almost 12, he told his astonished parents exactly what had been happening to him the last eight years. Aliens had been abducting him from his bed. As Jason recalled, it's always the light that comes first, then I see the tall one rise up at the foot of the bed. 
Suddenly there's lots of little ones everywhere. They're fuzzy and indistinct, and they move very fast. I can't move or speak, but I'm awake and I can see and hear and feel. I want to scream and run, but the sound doesn't come out and my body doesn't move. I hate them. I hate them, I have to go with them. They take me to an operating theater, like at the hospital. It's all white and shiny. Sometimes it's a circular room with a metal floor. It's always cold. There, there. The big one touches me but I don't feel it, like as if I've had an anesthetic dot but you don't believe me, you just think I'm making it all up. Jason's mother, Anne, would believe him though, and went on to explore the phenomenon affecting her son's life in a book titled Abducted. It details many strange events that occurred, such as being visited by the men in black on many occasions. Also, she described how an investigator who had been helping them had his house broken into looking for materials or notes on the case. Like many other alien abductees, Jason experienced multiple abductions over many years. Skeptics claim that he suffered from sleep paralysis and also his memories were simply lucid dreams of the beings. Still, to this day, both Jason and Anne are convinced the abductions happened. On the evening of January 25th, 1967, in South Ashburnham, Massachusetts, Betty Andreessen, along with her children, mother and father, were enjoying a quiet evening at home. At the time, Betty was cleaning up in the kitchen, while her family was in the living room. Then, around 6.30 p.m., the light suddenly began blinking, and the power went out. As the children became frightened in the darkness, Betty ran to comfort them, and a reddish orangish light would beam through the kitchen window in the pitch dark house. Curiously, her father went to look out the kitchen window to see what it was. Shocked, he saw five odd looking beings coming toward the house in a hopping motion. He thought at first it was a prank and just kids but he soon realized it wasn't children and the beings were now floating. The wooden door then flew open and five strange beings walked right in. Then, in a truly unbelievable event, the beings would put the family in a state of suspended animation. One being would then begin to speak with Betty telepathically, allowing her to move freely while another one communicated with her father. Betty would later state she believed she was communicating with the leader. It was about five feet tall, while the others were around four feet. All the creatures had wide eyes, small ears, and noses and pear-shaped heads. Their mouths never moved and were only slits on their face. The creatures wore blue overalls with boots, with a big belt and allegedly the sleeves of the overalls had a bird-like creature on them. The aliens had three fingers and didn't walk but floated from place to place. As everyone was held frozen, Betty felt relaxed but she was also worried for her children. The beings realized this and assured her that they would not harm them. In a gesture of goodwill, they released one of her daughters temporarily so that she could tell Betty she was okay. Once assured her family would be okay, Betty agreed to be taken by the creatures. She was taken outside the home, and the beings transported her straight through the closed wooden door. She then levitated up to a silver UFO around 20 feet in diameter right in her backyard. One of the beings would stay behind and keep her family in suspended animation during this time. Then, Kwasga, the leader, was able to make the craft seemingly vanish, although the interior of it, Betty could see. They entered the craft, and Betty was taken to a red room. On the ship, she would be subject to test 
although she would later recall they didn't frighten her. Allegedly, Betty would be taken to another world. She says when she next departed the ship, she saw a strange world with red sand and adobe or mud brick buildings. Here on this planet, Betty would have some religious type of experience. She would meet a being whom she believed was God and would be told she was the chosen one. Next, as she prepared to return, she would get a lecture from the leader, Quasga, who would let her know that she would forget everything for some time. Quasga then stated that the beings loved humanity and had came to help. Betty would return around four hours later and reunite with her family, who, at that time, were released from the trance-like state and safe. Initially, Betty was only to, able to recall certain things from the experience, such as the red light entering and the beings entering the home. As time progressed, though, Betty would attempt to have her story investigated and researched. In 1974, she reached out to the National Enquirer, who were looking for alien abduction stories. However, even the tabloid newspaper thought her story was too strange. Then, in 1977, the case would be examined by a full team of specialists. This included a solar physicist, an electronics engineer, an aerospace engineer, a telecommunications specialist, a UFO investigator, hypnotist, and psychiatrist. After 12 months, Betty had passed two lie detectors and endured 14 long, regressive hypnotic sessions. The results of this investigation revealed that Betty, along with her daughter, were able to give detailed descriptions of their encounter and what they experienced. Betty's daughter says she was abducted as well. The team would then conclude the claims probably were legitimate. Later, Betty would go on to recall previous encounters and abductions, as well as activity going into the 1990s. Her claims are still being investigated today, with at least half a dozen books written on the subject. Despite the attention, there doesn't appear to be a consensus view on whether these events were blown out of proportion or even actually happened. Some people believe that her Christian values might have influenced her claims around meeting a divine being. Other skeptics point to details of the story changing over the years. For example, in early drawings, the eyes of the beings were similar to human eyes. However, later sketches would show the eyes to be large and all black. One other thing that skeptics tend to point out is that the majority of her story was only made available after hypnotic regression. Leading questions in these sessions can create false memories. Non-believers also point out that she came forward in 1977, the same year the popular movie The Close Encounters of the Third Kind came out. Still, we should remember she did try and seek help in the years before. Believers of this case will point out that a team of specialists did investigate the case, and they all believed she was telling the truth. It also doesn't appear major details of the story changed over the years. Betty's entire family would back her story, except her husband, who was in the hospital at the time. This case is certainly a fascinating one, and will continue to be studied by researchers and ufologists for the foreseeable future. On the evening of Thursday, October 4th, 2001, in Gondaya, Australia, three Australians would experience a terrifying event that would change their lives forever. Keith Rylance, then age 40, his wife Amy, then age 22, and their business partner, Petra Heller, age 39 at the time, had been working on the property to develop their new business, a winery. During the time, 
They had brought their recreational vehicle and were living out of it. On the night of the 4th, around 9.30 p.m., Keith decided to go to sleep while Amy decided to watch TV in the living space. Petra, too, decided to head to sleep, leaving her door slightly open. Around 11.15 p.m., Petra woke up and looking through her door to the lounge space, she saw a rectangular beam coming in the open window. Inside the beam, Petra says she saw Amy head first and sleeping, being slowly carried out the window. Oddly, other items that were sitting on the coffee table next door were being carried out as well. Petra, before passing out due to sheer terror, would peek through the window and see a UFO hovering slightly above the ground. As Petra regained consciousness, she woke up screaming, which immediately woke up Keith. Petra would later state she didn't believe she was out for that long. As Keith walked into the lounge room, he would meet an extremely upset Petra, who was crying and screaming incoherently. Keith would soon see the window screen was torn on the window that was opened. As Petra continued sobbing, she finally was able to tell Keith what happened, but Keith refused to believe it and ran outside searching for Amy. Frustrated and terrified, he decided to call the police. Keith called the police and reported that his wife had been abducted. After an hour and a half, Senior Constable Robert Maranga from the Tiaro police and another officer arrived. Both Keith and Petra told the officers that Amy had been abducted by a spaceship, but the officers didn't believe them and suspected foul play. Soon, Sergeant John Bosnak was called in and the three began investigating the property. Soon they noticed a bush to the left of the window showed that it had been affected by something, possibly heat. On the other side of the window, a similar type of bush didn't display the same signs. Samples were taken of the bush and the screen was examined too. While police were investigating, the telephone rang. A woman was calling from the town of McKay, Australia, which was around 800 kilometers north of where they resided. The woman told Keith that she had encountered a woman who was dehydrated and distressed and took her to McKay Hospital. The woman let Keith know that the woman later identified as Amy Rylance was okay and was being examined by a doctor. The McKay police would then venture to the hospital to get a sworn state from, from Amy. What Amy recalled next would truly be jaw-dropping. Amy recalled the last thing she remembered was lying on the couch in the recreational vehicle. Then, the next thing she remembered was lying on a bench in a strange rectangular room. She had no memory of floating through the window, as Petra described. In the room, she recalls the walls were illuminating as well as the ceiling. She stated she said hello, to which she heard a voice, which she described as male, asking her to remain calm and assuring her she would be okay. Then the wall opened and something walked into the rectangular room. The alien was six feet tall, slender, and covered from head to foot in a full body suit. There was a black mask covering its face with holes for the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. The being told Amy they were returning to a place not far from where she was abducted. The being said they couldn't return her to her property because the lights were wrong and it might not be safe. Amy would then fall asleep on the bench. The next thing she remembered was waking up disoriented on the ground looking up at the trees. She got up and began walking through the forest, smelling the ocean. Finally, after walking for some time, she ended up hitting a highway and walked toward a light coming from a gas station. At the station, she went inside and the staff immediately started helping her as they saw she was in bad shape. They offered her water and began asking questions regarding who she was 
and what happened. Amy initially wasn't able to answer those questions and didn't know where she was. They asked her if she was drinking earlier or doing drugs and Amy said no. She was tired, sore, and lethargic and asked a woman to take her to the hospital. The woman and her friend took Amy to the hospital and there Amy would speak with two police officers and also eventually she spoke with her husband Keith on the phone. After the hospital she went to the McKay police station where she gave her statement. In her statement Amy would indicate nothing like this had ever happened to her but she did note an experience she had when she was younger. When she was in school, she recalls seeing a large UFO surrounded by smaller objects. The police put Amy in a motel until her husband would arrive. As Petra and Keith arrived later during the day, they talked extensively about what had happened. They took detailed notes and photographed a triangular mark on Amy's right inner thigh. Fascinatingly, Amy's hair had started to show her former color, as well as her body hair was longer than one would expect for just a few hours. Many believe that this indicates that a decent amount of time had passed for Amy. After compiling the notes on October 5th, the day after Amy was taken, Keith Rylance contacted the Australian UFO Research Network office. The case immediately piqued the interest of Diane Harrison who took to the call. She would reach out to Bill Chalker and both would investigate the case. On October 9th, Diane and Bill then traveled to Gandaya, arriving at the Whispering Winds Winery property just after 10 p.m. After beginning their investigation, Diane and Bill would find several things that seemingly cast doubt on the trio's story. First, Keith and Amy owned a dog. One, that could have possibly caused the screen damage. Second, the damage to the plants seems to have a scientific explanation. This could be due to prosaic causes, such as heat stress. They noted a plant at the front of the house had similar damage. After some research, it was discovered that the plant species often had random damage. After Diane and Bill investigated the property, They were going to head up to McKay to meet with the three. However, as they were supposed to meet, the motel indicated that the three had already left and looked to be bouncing around to different hotels. While Keith would later call and apologize, he would state that the men in black were searching for them. Keith stated that they would go into hiding until further notice. This little known UFO case has become quite controversial since it occurred. Some believed it happened, while others question it. Supporters note that it has multiple police reports documenting it. It has multiple witnesses. It's also tough to explain how Amy traveled 800 kilometers in 90 minutes. Other support includes the photographs and her body hair that have grown. As we mentioned, the plants and screen could have been explained. It is still possible, though, something else caused this. The witnesses are all deemed credible, and we've seen cases where abductees are dropped off far from where they were abducted, most notably the Travis Walton case. One other piece of evidence is that the three were seemingly terrified when it occurred and disappeared due to fear. If they were lying and trying to become famous, we would expect the opposite. Still, Skeptics exist and question this case since no hard evidence seems to exist. Some question whether she really traveled the distance in less than three hours. In other words, did Keith or someone else drive her up there earlier in the day or possibly the day before? While this case was investigated early on, it's important to note a thorough investigation wasn't conducted as the three were scared and often moving around. Perhaps if this was looked at with more detail and earlier, more evidence would have been found regarding this strange incident. In August 1993, 27-year-old Kelly Cahill, her husband and three children 
were driving home after a visit to a friend's house. As they drove home on a familiar route, they suddenly came upon a light. A light so bright, they were almost blinded. As Kelly covered her eyes from the intense light, with her hands over her eyes, she frantically asked her husband, What are you going to do? Her husband responded, frightened himself, that he would keep on driving. Within what seemed like only a second or two, Kelly was now very relaxed, suddenly calmed by the disappearance of the intense, glowing light that had turned night into day for a brief few moments. The first words out of Kelly's mouth were, What happened? Did I black out? But her husband had no answer to give her, as he cautiously continued driving his family home. Upon their safe arrival, Kelly could smell a horrific odor, like vomit, and she suddenly felt as though something was missing from the drive home. Indeed, something was missing. The family had lost an hour or so of time, and no one could recall where it went. That night as Kelly undressed for bed, she noticed a strange, triangular mark on her stomach. It was a mark she had never seen before. It must have been created earlier in the night, but Kelly wondered how and why, and most importantly, by whom. Kelly would suffer from fatigue for the next two weeks and was taken to the hospital on two occasions. One for a severe stomach pain, and another for a uterine infection. Soon, Kelly would begin to remember details of that fearful night as her memory surrounding it came back. She recalled seeing the object they had seen in a slightly different place than she first remembered. It was hovering in a gully, and the UFO was massive, around 150 feet in diameter. Kelly also remembered that when the object was first spotted, her husband had stopped the car and both she and her had gotten out of the vehicle and walked in the direction of the ship, not scared. Kelly believed they were being subconsciously drawn to the enigmatic, otherworldly craft. In a surprise, they noticed another car stopped on the side of the road. As they walked down toward the craft, they saw a creature unlike either of them had ever seen before. It was black, but not in color. It was devoid of color, but she could see bodily features. Kelly believed it was soulless. It was as if all matter was removed where its presence was. The black alien was taller than an average man, about seven feet tall, and its eyes were large, like a fly's, glowing red. After being mesmerized by the sight of the being, she saw more of them. Heaps of them is how Kelly described them as she stared into the open field. The aliens were out there in the field beneath the immense flying craft. The beings seemed to congregate in small groups, and one group glided in the air toward Kelly and her husband, covering a hundred yards in a matter of seconds. Another group was approaching the other car, which sat motionless near the hovering craft. Kelly felt that the creatures were evil. She clung to her husband, fighting the feeling of blacking out. Her great fear and dread would cause her to scream at the alien-looking entities to leave them alone. She remembered going unconscious. Then she woke back up in the car. As strange as this encounter seems, the occupants from the other car would come forward and corroborate Kelly's story. The occupants would tell almost the exact same story, a story of abduction, mind control, and embarrassing procedures. Kelly recalled through dreams the black alien stooping over her helpless, nude body. From all indications of the descriptions of the aliens, they were intruding into our dimension, taking space in our universe, yet without solid form. Though shapes, heads, eyes, and arms could be distinguished, 
Strangely, this case parallels another UFO case, which happened in 1928 in Leicester, England, which had translucent apparent beings as well. That said, many UFO researchers believe these strange and eerie beings were from a parallel universe and slipped into our world. Others say they too were from a not distant future. The story of Kelly Cahill has been studied and researched by many researchers and ufologists, but nothing new has been uncovered. That said, Kelly was widely considered to be an honest and reliable person, and her case is considered legitimate by many UFO investigators. Scientists and mental health professionals typically try and explain away alien abductions as being the result of false memory syndrome, sleep paralysis, suggestibility, or deception. However, many abduction cases simply rule these out. In particular, cases with multiple abductees interviewed by various professionals tend to lead to only one real conclusion. Something strange and unexplained did occur, and modern science simply cannot explain these. In today's episode, we will examine an alien abduction case with overwhelming evidence that something truly bizarre happened to these women. And as we will see, it wasn't the result of sleep paralysis, suggestibility, or any other medical explanation. On January 6, 1976, three women decided to drive 35 miles from their home in Liberty, Kentucky, in order to have dinner at the Redwoods restaurant, which was located between Stanford and Lancaster, Kentucky. Louise Smith, Elaine Thomas, and Mona Stafford wanted to celebrate the 36th birthday of Mona Stafford. The women had an enjoyable dinner, and none of them had any alcohol. After dinner, around 11.15 p.m., the women headed back home, expecting to return around midnight. As the women began driving home, a bright red object appeared in the sky. Mona believed at first that it was an airplane that caught fire. Soon, though, the object would descend from the right side of the road to directly ahead of them. As this was occurring, they could see that this was not an airplane, but something much bigger, gigantic, and larger than two houses. The object stopped about a hundred yards in front of them, stretching across the road on both sides. It began rocking back and forth for a couple of seconds and then shifted off to the left. The women kept driving, though, and assumed that whatever it was had kept going. However, it had not moved on. Around a quarter of a mile up the road, a blue light appeared through the rear window of the car. At first, they thought it was a police officer going to pull them over, but soon they came to realize that the flying object had circled around and came up behind them. Suddenly, something took control of the car, away from the driver, Louise Smith. The car speeded up, even though Miss Smith took her foot off the gas. They were soon going around 85 miles per hour. Mona Stafford was seated in the passenger seat and tried to help Louise regain control of the car, but couldn't. At this time, the women's eyes began to burn, and the ignition lights lit up on the instrument panel, usually an indication that the car's engine is stalled, but the car was still speeding down the road. Soon, they saw a wide, well-lit road ahead of them, and then moments later, the scene became Highway 78. They recognized that they were just outside of Hustonville, and oddly, they were a full eight miles from where they had just been. Perhaps even more strange, as they checked the time, they discovered 
than an hour and 20 minutes had passed. They got to Louise Smith's trailer in Liberty at 1.25 a.m., almost an hour and a half late. They went inside to gather themselves and calm down. When they did, they found that they each had a red mark, similar to a burn, on the backs of their necks. Also, all the women had burning, irritated eyes. Louise Smith went into the bathroom and removed her watch to wash her face. As she did, astonishingly, she saw that the hands of her watch were spinning much quicker than normal. When she splashed water on her face, she discovered that contact with water caused pain in her hands and face. They went next door to their neighbor to let him know what they had seen. Mr. Lao Li had them separately sketch the object that they had seen, and the sketches were extremely close. At that point, they called the police in the local Navy office but neither showed any interest in their story. In the coming days, Mona Stafford had more problems with her eyes than did the other two women, and she sought medical help for severe conjunctivitis. Louise Smith's pet bird was now inexplicably terrified of her. When Smith first arrived home after her experience, instead of her usual happy greeting. She received a frightening reaction from her parakeet. It flew into the side of its cage and fluttered its wings in a wild display of fear. Smith proclaimed that since the first night home, her parakeet had ignored her. Later, investigators tested her pet and found when other people came close, the bird acted normally but became terrified around Smith. Smith's car also started to develop mysterious electrical problems. As word spread, the Navy allegedly gave information about the story to the media, and the story was soon picked up in the local newspapers. MUFON investigator Jerry Black would hear the story and soon began investigating. He called the three women, asking for an interview, but the women were reluctant to relive the event. After more phone calls from Black and him offering his sympathy and compassion, the three witnesses agreed to an interview. Also, Black would invite Peggy Schnell of Blanchester, Ohio. She had experience with these kinds of cases, and Black felt that the three would feel more comfortable with a feminine presence. As the five of them met, Black learned several things. Black knew that the three women were on physical pain and all were chain smoking, which they blamed on the experience. Also, he learned they all had an unquenchable thirst and alleged extreme weight loss since the event. The women gave some details of their observations of the UFO, its structure and how it moved. They also discussed some how the object affected them. These memories were painful to all three, and they struggled to recall details and hoped that someone might be able to help them. As the women were distraught over the missing time, they were reassured that they would be able to under undergo regressive hypnosis and uncover the lost time. It was believed that this would alleviate some of their emotional stress. After the initial interview, the investigators knew that the three women's story was disturbing, yet solid as could be. Although from Wyoming, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, a highly well-respected ufologist and physician, heard of the case and came to Kentucky. Sprinkle would go on to perform extensive hypnotic regression sessions with all of the women. The sessions revealed that during the lost time, the women were taken on board the object they had seen. In the craft, they were medically examined by shadowy beings that they later identified as being similar to depictions of aliens. 
In July of 1976, Lexington Police Department Detective James Young separately gave each woman a lie detector test regarding their experience, and they all passed with no problems. The Stanford abduction has all the classic components of a UFO abduction. Strange lights, lost time, physical and emotional pain, and lost memories. As such, it's one of the most well-known alien abduction cases to occur in the southern United States in recent memory. There was much strange activity that occurred, and even more, it really shows the psychological and physical pain that the alien abductees experience. Although skeptics would say the women went on to sell their story to the National Enquirer and were motivated by financial incentives, we should note the women were struggling financially and emotionally, and the money was really needed due to the experience. It's also important to remember that these women were considered reputable and passed lie detector tests. We'll probably never know exactly what happened that night, why they were chosen, or whether the craft didn't mean to appear in the first place. However, it's clear something did happen, something strange and disturbing. This case has overwhelming evidence, multiple witnesses, interviews by multiple professionals, and one, the skeptics, will struggle to explain away. In today's episode, we will examine the alien abduction of Filiberto Cardenas, Cuban immigrant living in Miami, Florida in the late 1970s. There are many aspects that make this case truly remarkable. First, this case had multiple independent witnesses as well as multiple abductees. Second, this case is considered very credible as it was investigated by a special team of professionals, including engineers, doctors, a psychologist, a neurologist, and a professional hypnotist. The consensus that for three years of research was that an abduction did in fact occur. Finally, there were multiple hypnotic regressions performed by different hypnotists over the years and the same exact story emerged from all sessions. With that, let's go ahead and dive into the story. On the evening of January 3rd, 1979, Filiberto Cardenas was in his gift shop in Miami, Florida when his friend Fernando called him and asked him to go with him to buy a pig from the local merchants. Filiberto agreed and soon Fernando arrived at the gift shop with his wife Myrta and their daughter Isabel, who was then 13 years old. That evening, Filiberto asked Fernando to drive his station wagon since he was feeling tired, and after some time trying to buy a pig, they turned down on a rural dirt road. After driving on the road for some time, the car suddenly began to lose power, and soon, the engine died. Fernando tried to start the engine, but there was no response at all. The men decided to get out of the car and look under the hood. Fernando opened the hood, and they both looked at it to see what could be wrong. As they kept checking the car and the engine, Filiberto and Fernando suddenly realized that the engine was reflecting red and violet light. Right then, they heard a strange sound. Fernando later recalled, it sounded like a swarm of bees. The buzzing sound, as well as the light that illuminated the engine, became more intense, and soon, the whole car began to shake violently. Miss Marty who was sitting on the back seat with her daughter, Isabel, at her side, began to panic and scream. Miss Marty thought initially it was an earthquake, 
So she pulled Isabel down across the seat of the car and covered her with her body as she continued screaming. When Filiberto heard the yelling from Miss Marti and her daughter, he tried to run to their aid, but was suddenly paralyzed. He could see the lights and hear, but he could not move. He felt as though something restrained him and impeded his movement. Fernando, scared, tried to crawl further under the hood in order to seek protection, but he also found himself immobile with his feet sticking out in the air from under the hood and he was unable to move. An unseen force began to lift Filiberto in the air and Fernando could see Filiberto as he began to levitate. Filiberto began pleading and begging that he would not be taken but continued he would rise up. Then the noise in the light stopped and everything returned to normal. Fernando came out from under the hood and looked at the sky to see a UFO flying away. They knew right away he had been taken. After Filiberto disappeared, Fernando got back in the car and was able to start it and drive away. They drove back to town and began making calls. Fernando phoned Filiberto's wife. They debated calling the police since they knew how crazy their story sounded. Finally, as they came to the town of Hawaii, they saw a police car. Fernando stopped and explained to the sergeant in the patrol car what had just happened. At first, the police presumed that Filiberto would be found lost or unconscious. Fernando even doubted himself and decided to go back and look at the area. Since it was already dark, the police tried to contact the airbase at Homestead so they could send an airplane or a helicopter with lights where the incident took place. While this was all taking place, Filiberto was found two hours later on the Tomai Trail 16 kilometers south of the spot where he had disappeared. The first officer to arrive on the scene was patrolman William Christian, who at first believed he was drunk or someone who had been assaulted and left on the highway. A second officer arrived. They could not communicate with Filiberto because of the language barrier and also the condition that he was in. Filiberto spoke Spanish and knew very little English, having been raised in Cuba. They searched his pockets and found ID and decided to take him to the police station. On the way there, Filiberto began to come to. From the ID papers found on him, the police radioed ahead to the police dispatcher a general description of what was happening. Meanwhile, in Hawaii, the police were getting ready to go out and search for the missing man when they received his description over the radio. They suspended the search, and Miss Cardenas, Fernando, and Fernando's family went to the police station where Filiberto was. After some time, Filiberto was able to recall his memory of being abducted, and here is what he remembered. On the night he was initially abducted, after having been paralyzed by a combination of the mysterious light and buzzing sound, Filiberto woke up in a seat that seemed to hold him in place by some kind of suction restraining all his movements. He was in a small room, and beside him were three strange figures. One of the strange beings approached him, and it was carrying a special kind of helmet in its hands. He raised it up and placed it on Filiberto's head. This helmet seemed to be full of tiny needles that came down to his shoulders. The beings tried to communicate with Filiberto, speaking in a language that sounded like German. When they realized that Filiberto did not understand, one of the beings rotated a button on the right side of his chest and then began to speak in English. 
Filiberto indicated that he did not understand that either. Again, the strange being rotated the button and began this time to speak in Spanish. Meanwhile, they continued doing tests on Filiberto's body. Later, Filiberto would find 108 marks on his body. After some time, the beings made Filiberto pass through to another larger room. There, on a high seat like a throne, was seated an individual wearing a cape. This person, or being, seemed to be the boss. It addressed Filiberto in perfect Spanish, while at the same time transmitting ideas telepathically. The conversation revolved in turn from the subjects of human beings to humanity. On the walls, the beings projected images similar to television pictures that showed scenes from the past, the present, and also the future. After this, they opened another door and Filiberto was carried to a small room where he was placed in a seat similar to the first which sucked him down and impeded his movements. He was now in a small ship that eventually broke off from the mothership. Filiberto said next his spacecraft plunged into the sea and toward an underground base. As the ship slowed, Filiberto could see now a tunnel with walls that seemed lit up. The ship entered into this underwater tunnel and later came to stop in a place that was completely dry. It looked like a large cave as it was made out of rock and had strange symbols. One of them was in the form of a serpent, as big as an electric pole. The other symbols were smaller. In this place, the entities got out from the ship and took Filiberto to a rock where they let him sit down and rest. Then, the beings opened an enormous door and a number of people came out. Someone came up to Filiberto and said, Welcome. This individual spoke to him in perfect Spanish with a South American accent. He looks like a human being and perhaps at one time he even was. He informed Filiberto that he was from Earth and that he had been for some time working with the entities. Also, he said that Filiberto should be happy because he was going to receive some instructions from a human being like us. Then the beings took Filiberto through another door and they began walking down what looked like a street in a city. They then crossed it and entered a small building. Inside the building, an examination would occur. After this, the entities let him get up and get dressed again. They demonstrated by means of the televisions to Filiberto new and different things that were going to occur. After this, he was taken to a different ship, which would soon depart. After a very short trip, the door of the UFO opened and Filiberto was let out of the ship into a field. That same year, Filiberto would have another encounter. This time, though, his wife Iris would experience it as well. On the night of February 21st, 1979, Filiberto and Iris couldn't sleep and decided to go where Filiberto had been abducted on January 3rd. There, they both entered a hovering, unidentified flying object. Inside, two men met them and one woman, around four feet tall. The three of these beings were dressed in tight-fitting, silvery suits that covered everything except for their faces. The outfits had a serpent-like emblem on their chest area. An antenna-like device was covering their ears. The beings communicated with Filiberto and Iris through telepathy and spoke among themselves in an Arabic sounding language. Interestingly, the night that they were abducted, there were multiple reports 
of UFL activity at the nearby Miami International Airport. One of the older employees at the airport had observed a massive mothership and various smaller UFOs flying all around it. The employee said he was with five or six people watching this for 20 to 30 minutes. They watched it for so long they got tired of watching it. UFOlogists were able to connect the UFOs directly above the place where Filiberto and Iris were abducted. Years later, on December 6, 1985, Filiberto claimed that he was abducted again and carried to the same base under the water. One final strong case for these abductions was that six years later, on March 30th, 1986, another hypnotic regression was performed. This time, a different team was used using hypnotist Mercy de Armas and hypnotist Rodolfo Morales. Results from the initial hypnotic session and this session were compared, with no differences at all being found. With so much circumstantial evidence, it's hard to deny that something had happened to Filiberto. The matching hypnotic sessions in the airport witnesses, the police report the first night Filiberto disappeared specifically mentions under the type of offense, close encounter of the third kind. One concluding thought is that the Cardenas never seek to profit nor attempted to seek fame from any of these encounters. Many describe dead silence in the jungle or woods as an omen. It is said that no noise is a sign of an apex predator lurking, with animals sensing and knowing the presence before humans. Furthermore, many speculate the dead silence can be interpreted as something far more worse than an animal attack. Such is the case that happened with John Rents. On the night of August 16, 1971, Rents, a guard at Francis E. Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne, Wyoming, stated he was abducted by aliens. Rents was headed back to the barracks around 6.45 p.m. after having beers in the mess hall, and as he was walking back, he crossed over the Cow Creek Bridge and noted how eerily dead silent it was. Just before he got to the middle of the bridge, he heard a paralyzing sound, similar to loud thumping heartbeats. At the same time, all around the bridge, the area lit up like daytime. He also heard a heavy breathing-like sound, and the bridge began to sway in a wave-like motion and then stopped. After finally stopping, a terrified Rents began running to the other side of the bridge. However, before he reached it, he noticed that he had dropped his pipe and went back to grab it. After he turned around, the bridge was still lit up and the loud sound still existed. As he was able to find his pipe and went down to grab it, he then looked up and was stunned to see a six to seven foot tall being staring right at him. The creature was only about three feet away. Rents described the being as having a medium build with a large head and long arms. It was wearing something similar to a wetsuit. The eyes were covered with what appeared to be a one-piece lens that went across both eyes with a nasal area joined in with it. Rents believed it was a blast shield. The hands of the being consisted of three long fin fingers that ended in claws. The feet were three-toed and did not appear to have any heels. Next, as Rents stood up on the bridge, the being motioned 
for him to come closer. Frightened, Rents then turned and ran away. Rents's next memory was being picked up by two soldiers on a military jeep. There was a seven hour period of time that was missing, which Rents couldn't remember anything. For years, Rents went on living his life wondering what happened to him that night. Then, finally he decided to undergo hypnotic regression to recall what had happened to him. Rents recalled being inside some kind of cockpit in a spaceship along with another being who spoke to him telepathically. As he looked out the window, the craft flew in between two huge mountains where there was no vegetation anywhere. Then, Rent said he exited the craft and followed the being through a huge door on the side of a mountain. Here, they entered a small, silver-colored room which had a table that was floating. On the hovering table, there was a corpse of an extraterrestrial. The creature on the table had a larger head and a face that resembled that of a wasp. The being was about four to five feet in length and seemed to have an outer shell, like an insect would, similar to an exoskeleton. Rents recalled the humanoid emitted an unbearable foul odor resembling rotten eggs and sulfur. The mouth was, was wide open and the teeth were razor sharp. At this point, the being told Rents to leave the room. Outside the room, he saw a strange, saucer-shaped craft that sat on two pillars, and the being told him to go inside and sit on the left seat. In the craft, Rents saw numerous strange symbols on what he thought was a control panel. There, an electric motor-like sound came about, and the craft took off. After some time, the witness remembered the craft attacking a large, mountainous area resembling a beehive. It appeared that the beings who took him were hostile toward these aliens. He could see numerous creatures inside. The beings appeared to be scrambling around in the beehive structure, and there was about 200 of them, and they appeared to be the same as the insect insectoid that was on the floating table. After destroying the beehive structure, the craft landed in the destroyed complex. Here, Rents recalls seeing a live creature with the face of a wasp that was wearing a dark cloak. At this point, the tall humanoid arrived in and killed the living creature. The next thing Rents remembers is being returned to the Air Force Base. Many question Rens's story as far-fetched and not plausible. First off, if true, what would be the purpose of the aliens taking him on a battle mission? Also, Many skeptics point out, why would someone so terrified run back to get their pipe? Although he still probably would have been taken, it surely doesn't make sense for someone to risk their life over a pipe. It's not clear as well why Rents waited to get hypnotherapy. It's certainly plausible he wanted to just live a normal life, and then as time went on, he had to know what had happened to him that night. Still, it's important to note his abduction case does share similar traits with others, including lost time and extraterrestrials communicating telepathically. On October 12, 1959, Arizonian Brian Scott was celebrating his 16th birthday and living as a normal American teenager. All that would change 
very soon, though. As Brian was walking home from celebrating his birthday, he noticed a reddish-orange ball of light hovering above, over his dog. The ball was oval-shaped, transparent, and becoming more solid in the center. The size of the object was about six to eight inches in diameter and reddish orange. Then the ball of light came right at his head until it was just a few inches from his face. And then suddenly it shot straight up. As Brian stood trying to make some, si some sort of sense and reason out of the mystifying incident, he got the impression that some sort of communication had taken place. Strange thoughts and pictures started appearing in his mind, thoughts that weren't his own. As the years went on, Brian lived a seemingly normal life, getting married, working as a draftsman, and having kids. Around 12 years later, on the evening of March 14th, 1971, Scott, along with his friend Nick Corbin, would drive to the open desert near the Superstition Mountains just outside of Phoenix, Arizona. What was particularly strange to Scott, both then and now, was he had no idea why he was driving out to this part of the desert, other than he felt they would find an ideal place for target shooting. Suddenly, on the drive, he would pull over his vehicle, and both men exited and stood at the side of the road. They both scanned the area, with Brian looking up at the sky. And as he did, a strange craft moved overhead and into his field of vision. He would later describe the craft as oval and glowing, and much too big to be a conventional aircraft. Soon, the craft would start heading towards Brian. His mind told him to turn, run, and take over. However, before he could move, the craft was directly overhead him. The craft was so big that when Scott looked up, he could no longer even see the sky. As this was occurring, he felt a pulsating, pulling feeling that lifted him upwards into the craft. What happened next was perhaps even more astonishing. Brian found that his friend Nick was inside the craft as well, appearing to be waiting for him. The two of them were taken into a small room that began to be filled with a fog or mist. Then they were confronted by four or five very horrifying creatures. Brian described them as having gray scaly skin like that of a crocodile or a rhino with a thicker patch of hide over the front torso. Scott and his friend had their clothes taken off and then let off in different directions. Brian Scott felt like he was either carried or made to float by these beings. He described the ETs as being around seven feet tall and looking like a combination of earth animals. They had three fingers and a thumb on the side. Brian would then undergo an intense physical examination, which first involved him being restrained to the wall by an invisible force. In the middle of this room was a pole which ran from floor to ceiling. On this pole was an odd box that seemed to direct an intense beam of light towards him. One of the strange and horrifying creatures stood near the box, seemingly manipulating it some way. As Brian watched the creatures and the mist, he noticed how the foggy substance would soak into the creature's skin. By this time, the box on the pole was placed on the floor, and consequently, the laser beam was aimed at his feet. 
He could recall that simultaneously he could feel a sensation of warm and cold fluids running over his lower limbs. Then the light moved to his eye. As the light reached into his mind, he felt a severe headache spread throughout his head. At the same time, there was a strange numbing on his mind. Then the light went out and the creature manipulating him left the room. Almost instantly, another creature would enter, and this one was much taller than the others. Brian estimated it to be at least nine feet in height. The giant made its way directly over to where Brian stood pinned against the wall. It reached out and placed its hand on Brian's head. Instantly, a rush of, as Brian would say, thousands of thoughts spilled into his mind. Brian stated that his mind was transported to an alien world where he observed more of the strange beings walking around a planet of jagged peaks in a foggy atmosphere. After this experience, the restraints were lifted and he was able to walk around the ship. Soon, he rejoined with his friend and they returned to the ground. The last memory he had of the strange craft was a terrible odor, described as rotten socks as if someone hadn't taken their shoes off for 20 years. As Nick and Brian were transported back to the desert, they were gone for about two hours. They then drove home where Brian would forget most of what happened. All he could truly re recall at the time was of first witnessing the strange craft in the sky. It would be some time before he managed to unlock those memories. However, almost two years to the day, on the 22nd of March, 1973, he would find himself traveling back to the spot of his abduction. Upon arriving, he would claim to meet a humanoid en entity named the Host. What was communicated to Scott from this mysterious figure at this time is not known. At the time, he began to believe that not only was he under observation by the beings, but that he was being slowly educated by them. The abductions would continue, though, as Brian was subject to abduction encounters on the night of October 25th, 1973, and also he would be abducted again on November 21st, 1975, and again on December 22nd, 1975. It was after his initial reports to investigators and researchers in October 1975 when Scott first underwent hypnotic regression. The session would take place at the Anaheim Memorial Hospital under the care of Dr. McCall. During the sessions, Scott would recall the details of his first two abduction encounters. However, during this retelling, he would begin to speak in a bizarre and unnerving, mechanical-like voice. Furthermore, when this strange voice was examined, it was found to produce an exact 1,000 cycles per second on an oscillograph. Such sounds should not be able to be produced by the vocal cords of humans or animals. And this was one fascinating angle of the Brian Scott case. The strange recorded voices on audio cassettes. The voices either spoke through Scott or from other, or from other areas around the house. As UFO investigator, Timothy Beckley decided to investigate these tapes. He knew that even if a person tried to disguise his voice or attempt to imitate another person's voice, this could be easily discovered. Each voice is very much like a fingerprint. There are individual characteristics in each voice print that are designated for each speaker. As he learned that the voice print analysis 
of the various entities' voices were allegedly different that fascinated the investigators. Beckley spoke further with a technician who claimed to have analyzed the various voices connected and associated with Brian's case. He too indicated that they were quite different from one another. The company for whom the technician worked had wired Brian Scott for 24 hours a day for one week. They used a four channel recorder recording different frequency spectrums on each channel. They recorded the vibrations of the house on the low frequency channels and the static electricity was recorded on the high frequency channels. The culmination of the project led them to conclude that Scott was not producing the various voices of his own will. Although the technician did not claim to be the final authority, he commented that some of the frequencies that they recorded were, in his opinion, so low that generally speaking, a human voice could not produce them. During these initial meetings and sessions with Brian, many experts and representatives from various UFO organizations and other paranormal groups who came to interview and investigate Brian Scott's encounter came up with many different theories, claims, and points of view in order to attempt to explain his experiences. However, of these investigators, one would prove to be much more influ influential than the others, and this would be Beckley. Two months following the December 1975 abduction incident, Beckley became involved with the case. He would immediately begin by asking Scott about any paranormal or poltergeist type activity in the home. Brian would speak of white streaks of light and balls of light that would make their way through his house of their own accord. Even stranger was the pure flashes as if someone had placed a flash cube immediately in front of his face. One bizarre event though was what happened to Brian's wife, Marla. On one occasion, Marla would end up in such a confused state that she would end up in the hospital. She had returned home early from work after feeling suddenly sick. However, within minutes, she became confused and disoriented. She began uttering bizarre words and sentences that confused her further. Then, she would claim that while in the bathroom washing, she had suddenly felt hands all over her body. She was convinced that an invisible person had broken into the house. She would eventually calm down and describe what she had witnessed in more detail. Her descriptions matched the sudden memories of the alien entities from the March 1971 abduction. What unsettled him was that he had not spoken to her in such detail about the encounter, or she had never seen Brian's drawings. After taking Marla to the hospital to make sure she was not in any immediate medical danger, the couple would return home. However, several hours later, she would collapse again and begin to hyperventilate. By the time parametrics paramedics had arrived at the property, she became completely hysterical. It would ultimately take four paramedics to restrain her and bundle her in the waiting ambulance for further examination. When Brian returned home to the house and made his way to the room where there was a one-year-old baby's playpen, he was shocked to find the baby was no longer there. On the edge of panic, he began rushing from room to room, searching for their young child. Then, he noticed their pet dog barking, excitedly at the back door of the property. He opened it, and to his shock, could see the young child sat at the corner of their patio. How it had managed to get out of the playpen, locked, and specifically designed as they are to keep babies in, 
and then managed to get out of another locked door remains a mystery. As strange and unnerving as the experience undoubtedly was, one of the strangest aspects of Brian Scott's experiences were the continued encounters with the entity named the host. Brian says this being that comes through and possesses him. When it visit, it calls itself the host, speaking in what sounds like some sort of computerized language. Strangely, as the voice seems to come out of him, an inner voice that is not his, the entity says that I am one with it. It says, I am, I am, or you are one with me. When Brian asked if it has a name, he comes back and says, I am, I am. According to Brian, the host was a regular visitor to his house. One of the strangest things in this case was perhaps the strangest, strange voices in different languages that Brian would hear and speak. Brian would begin to speak in a foreign language that they later found out was Greek. The family has no idea how Brian managed to speak Greek, a language he has no familiarity with. On top of that, Brian began writing with his left hand, although he is right-handed. Once more, during these experiences, a strange voice began talking to him. Scott and his wife would ask who was speaking to them, and the ambiguous reply came back that it was Ashtar. Even more bizarre, Ashtar would speak directly to Marla, as if trying to prove its authenticity with this voice. Then, events would take another unsettling twist, one that would further forge the unlikely connections between events from the other side and events from elsewhere in the universe. Ashtar would begin to offer Maria riches and all the money in the world that was in exchange for her soul. Beckley would point out that Ashtar was remarkably similar to Ishtar, a goddess of ancient Babylon. What Beckley would also offer was that as opposed to such ghostly visitors being the same as the apparent extra extraterrestrial abductors, they may very well be separate entities in their own right, but ones attracted to the location due to the extreme vibrations already caused by the Scots' ongoing cosmic encounters. Over the years, there were many people who were a witness to strange and bizarre events involving Brian Scott. These would include such strange cases as automatic writing intricate drawings of, of advanced science and technology that he otherwise knew nothing about, as well as detailed information about the history of humanity. Often, these writings would be in an ancient language, much like the aforementioned incident where he began writing in Greek for no reason at all. Interestingly, and perhaps importantly, many of these ancient writings repeatedly point to an important link, a link between our contemporary world and something else. It is said Scott came to possess psychic-like abilities and telepathic abilities. One story involves him being able to bend a spoon with his mind. Like all UFO sightings and abductions, one must enter with both a skeptical and open mind. There are many witnesses who have gone on record as witnessing strange and, and even miraculous events in Brian Scott's presence. Too often, ufologists and paranormal investigators tend to research cases and only investigate their specific field of work. The bizarre case of Brian Scott shows that there appears to be multiple links between aliens the paranormal, extra-dimensional beings, possible reincarnation, and other unexplained phenomena. This case raises all sorts of questions with many interesting theories. 
Many believe the aliens provided some sort of special abilities to Brian, and this attracted beings from other dimensions as well as paranormal ent entities. Some are skeptical though, as the story was so sensational, and Brian seemed to lose many of his special abilities after a few weeks of receiving them. The, te the tapes were also analyzed decades ago and have not been analyzed with more modern equipment. As Brian has passed away, it's unfortunate the more UFOlogists cannot speak with him and that we are not able to know if these strange events would have keeps, kept persisting. On April 2nd, 1978, Tim Cullen dreamed that he was in a terrible car accident. Just seven days later, April 9th, he and his friend Ken Ruberg were driving on Highway 34 when Tim realized what he was experiencing then was indeed his recent dream. Seconds later, he rolled the car five times breaking his neck on the first roll. As the car finally stopped, Ken Ruber was able to get out of the car and help Tim up and out of the ditch. Eventually, Ruber waved down a passing station wagon, which took them to the nearest hospital. There, in the hospital under sedation, Cullen dreamed of an encounter with a UFO. After the car wreck, Tim recalled, I thought about stopping and going back to town, but didn't. After the event, Tim was confused and healing, and in the back of his mind, he knew something wasn't right. About six weeks later, Tim and his wife, Janet, a registered nurse, were driving north on Highway 59 near the Vernon Road Junction. They were returning home from a medical checkup in Denver. It was a dark, quiet night, and shortly after 11 p.m., Tim saw a large, dimly lit object pass in front of the car and go behind a low hill. As Tim recalled, it went out a ways, alongside, and as I brought the car down to a stop, it came back toward us a bit. I backed the car up, and the UFO went out to the west of us. It came in under the power and telephone lines and hovered over a pasture. It was about 100 feet long, 20 feet wide, and about 10 feet high. It didn't make any noise. There were two diffused lights that shone at the back of the craft, one a, light, a yellow light and the other red. We couldn't see it very good. We sat there and stared at it for a while. After we looked at the two lights for a few minutes, I turned to my wife and told her we might as well go on to town. At the time of the sighting, Janet was five months pregnant with her first child, and in what was perhaps foreshadowing of things to come, the Cullens had no memory of being taken aboard the craft, nor of missing any time. As time passed, though, feelings on that and on being abducted would change. Tim recalls, now when I started thinking about it, when I turned and started driving, I did have an odd feeling, but it didn't really register with me. I remember coming back to Yuma, but not looking at a clock. I was kind of shocked by the whole thing. I didn't really think of looking at a clock. Two years later, in 1980, Tim Cullen experienced another encounter, and terrifyingly, at exactly the same spot. The craft hovered, and two diffused yellow lights came on this time. Then one of the lights started blinking, and he stared at it. Tim remembers thinking, this can't be happening, not right here. The craft would then keep moving in back of and out from behind a low hill. Still, that wouldn't be the family's last sighting. 
in 1994 with his wife and three daughters, Tim encountered a smaller craft with a strobe light around 40 miles south of Yuma. Tim stated it hovered off the road in front of us and we stopped and looked at it for five to 10 minutes. It moved around for a while and finally went off to the north. Tim remembers his daughter's reaction specifically, stating the girls seemed mystified by it, but they were younger and I don't really think they realized the enormity of what they were seeing. In 1998, while setting rebar on a concrete job, Tim Collin hit his thumb with a hammer. Sometime later, he thought the finger could be dislocated, so he went to see Dr. Mark Hubner at the Yuma Clinic. The doctor suggested they take an x-ray. On returning with the film, Dr. Hubner asked, Did you know you have a piece of metal? In your arm. At that specific moment, Tim Cullen knew what the object was and who put it in there. He knew that he and Janet had, indeed, experienced missing time on May 30th, 1978. Tim didn't think much about UFOs or alien abductions before his experiences and had never seen or heard anything about alien implants. But after seeing the x-ray and knowing where the object in the film came from, he started exploring the internet about the subject of UFOs and alien abductions. He joined an online encounter group and learned about a man in California, Dr. Roger K. Lyer, who removed what were reported to be alien implants. Over the years, he would have multiple surgeries to remove what was believed to be alien implants. Analysis from seven of the first eight implants removed have shown that there's a membrane surrounding the metal core that seems to keep the metal core protected from foreign object rejection. These membranes were reddish brown and had several long perceptors which were connected to nerve endings on one end. When a magnet was placed a half an inch from the objects, they leapt with the magnets. The ninth alleged alien implant was surgically removed from the left forearm of Tim Cullen on Saturday, February 5th, 2000. This operation was performed at a medical facility in Thousand Oaks, California. The procedure was performed by a surgical team led by Dr. Roger Lair and the surgery by Dr. John D. Matriscano. I know nothing about UFOs or implants, Dr. Matriscano said after the operation, but I think that what's needed in this case is to be objective. Removal of the small melon seed type implant went very quickly and smoothly. The operation was videotaped by the Learning Channel for an upcoming show. At a MUFON board meeting, Tim would see the videotape of the object that was removed, which was shot through a microscope. The object was about 7 centimeters long and 4 centimeters wide. Tim Cullen has become a very outspoken about his experiences and about the object that was recently removed from his arm. Unlike others who have had implants removed, Tim has allowed his name to be used in the press and has given out his phone number. On returning to Yuma after the implant removal, Cullen told a story to Yuma's local paper, the Yuma Pioneer, and addressed both the congregations of his Catholic church and his wife's Presbyterian church. He has also been on the Art Bell Dreamland show with Dr. Roger Lair and host Ruby Street. Tim has become an inspiration for people who have been abducted. While at one of the church presentations, a woman reached out and touched Tim's sleeve 
My husband and I know exactly what we've been through. Another man emailed him and told him of an experience he had had. Tim recalls, I'm coming forward because someone has to put a face to the alien stories. Because more people to come forward. The more people we can find with implants, the more evidence we're going to have. We can study things a lot more and get things done. Get rid of the stigma around them. The events that have happened to me over the past 27 years have had an enormous effect on my life and what I believe. In a short span, time span, it was revealed to me that we are not the only intelligent life in the universe. It was also proven to me that God is with us always, without a doubt. While Tim's story certainly shares features of other alien abductees, many skeptics point to the fact that he put his name out there and appeared to be seeking attention with the matter. Still, people who know Tim and know his family stress they are regular, hard-working, honest people. Regardless, Tim has become a hero for many abductees who refuse to come forward with their own personal stories. In March 1979, Pat Udy a Monroe, North Carolina Cadillac salesman would have an experience that would leave him dumbfounded for more than two years. After leaving a friend's house, Udy could not account for over three hours of time. The situation would leave him so confused, he would seek out hypnotherapy sessions in order to determine what exactly happened. And what Udy thought would be just an ordinary night, he stopped at a friend's house in nearby Locust, North Carolina, and drank a few beers. Around 3 a.m., Udy left to head to his home in nearby Monroe. As he was driving home, Udy stated that he was looking at the stars on what was a clear night when suddenly he saw a bright light appear. This would be his last memory for a few hours. Around 6 a.m., Udy suddenly recalls driving south on Morgan Mill Road toward his home. He couldn't recall how he traveled around eight miles. As Udy arrived home about 6.20 a.m., he recalled that his eyes were burning and his skin was stinging and itching. The pain would remain for several days, and then fade away. Udy didn't seek medical treatment, but he did self-treat his itchy fingers and ankles with rubbing alcohol and lotion. He also put drops in his eyes to ease the discomfort. After two years of struggling to understand what happened to him, Udy finally decided to write a civilian UFO research center in Ohio. They referred Wadesboro UFO investigator Henry Morton to him. Morton interviewed Udy and suggested he speak with Richard Pino, a Winston-Salem psychologist. Pino and Udy would engage in multiple hypnotherapy sessions, which allowed Udy to recall some of what happened on that March night. Through his sessions, Udy recalled being on board a UFO and seeing an astronaut in a suit. He described the room as being well lit. While he was in that room, Udy noticed the strange astronaut-like being staring at him. He described the being as standing about five feet tall with two arms and two legs. The alien was wearing some sort of helmet with a dark visor covering his face. The being was wearing a suit which was light colored as well. Udi recalled 
he asked the being a lot of questions to which he got no response. He was curious as to how the craft worked. After a few minutes in the first room, Udi was taken into a second room, which was darker than the first. He recalls being scared and also being put in a chair similar to a doctor's chair as he was strapped in. He believes at this point that the creature was running some sort of test on him. Pain in his fingers afterward made Yudi speculate the being took a blood sample from him for analysis. In retrospect, Yudi believes the craft was oval-shaped and was propelled by some form of magnetism. He theorized that the ship was able to pick up his car and move it those eight miles down the road. Even after the sessions, Yudi said he still doesn't remember crossing the bridge over Rocky River or entering or leaving the UFO. The possible abduction of Pat Yudi shares similar characteristics with other abduction cases. Lost times, short beings with advisors, unexplained pain, and confusion. There appears to be good circumstantial evidence for this abduction. Udi was a salesman who relied on his reputation to help sell cars. He had a legitimate concern to keep the story contained as his wages depended on it. Further, the 1980s were a different time than today. UFO and alien incidents were considered an extreme taboo topic, and people were often mocked for coming forward with encounters and sightings. Still, skeptics will point to several features of the story and why it didn't occur. One, there was only one witness, and there was no other reports of activity in the area. Also, skeptics question why did he wait so long to report the incident? Was he going? To, was he looking to benefit financially? Also, there was the fact that Yudi was drinking alcohol. Perhaps he greatly understated the amount of alcohol that he consumed. It is well known that alcohol can cause people to experience lost time when intoxicated. Though most of these facts don't align that Yudi was able to recall these strange memories during a hypnosis session. It's extremely difficult to fake being hypnotized. Also, it doesn't appear Yudi looked to try and capitalize on this story. It's unclear whether Yudi had any more abduction or alien experiences. But it appears that the psychological sessions allowed him to move on with the rest of his life. At noon on a Friday in March 1978, Luis Carlos Serra, age 16, was looking for guava fruit in the jungle near his village of Penalva in the state of Maranao, Brazil. Suddenly, he heard a loud sound that scared him. He looked up and saw a light above the palm trees, so bright that it hurt his eye. Suddenly, he said, I fell flat on my back and couldn't move. I was paralyzed. A minute or so later, he began to rise slowly into the air, still in a horizontal position. He could see a round object just above the trees, and when he got higher, he saw a dome on top and three windows around it. One window was open and he floated in through the window and was lowered to the floor. Inside, there were three beings, about a meter tall, wearing metallic suits and dark visors. They were talking, but he did not understand them. 
and they simply ignored it. Louise then felt the UFO moving, and sometimes later, it stopped. He was levitated out of the UFO and came to rest on a nearby flat rock, still paralyzed. He could see tall grass, but no trees or birds or stars, only solid blackness above him. The little men put some kind of liquid in his mouth and he had passed out. He remembers nothing from that moment until 10 days later. The next Monday evening, three days and seven hours after he was abducted, a fisherman found him lying on the ground in the jungle, unable to move or speak. Louise was taken to the town's small hospital. He was rigid and catatonic. A doctor tried to move his arms and his legs, but simply could not. She pricked him all over with a sharp pin, but he showed no reaction at all. His head appeared to have been shaved, but the doctor told ufologist Bob Pratt that when she examined Louise more closely, she realized his hair had been burned off. His scalp wasn't singed, but the tops of his ears were very red. In addition, four molars had been broken off and were still bleeding. There were no bruises or marks on it, and his body was completely normal. The doctor was very surprised. Two days later, Louise was flown to a much larger hospital in the state capital. He was wide awake the entire time, just staring straight ahead. And he did not react to anything anyone said or did. It was nearly a week before Louise came to his senses. During most of that time, he had to be fed intravenously and catheterized. Altogether, at least eight doctors had examined him. Bob Pratt, a renowned ufologist who has spent decades researching Brazilian UFO cases, was able to talk with four of the doctors, including a neurologist and two psychiatrists. And none of them could explain what caused his condition. When Louise finally came to his senses, he told his story over and over again, without any variation. The case of Luis Carlos Serra is certainly an interesting case. Serra was cl clearly distraught and had suffered some sort of abuse or trauma. His catatonic state was something individuals who have been through shocking events often encounter. His abduction shares many traits with other alien abductions, such as being pulled into the craft, being in metallic suits, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Still, some question other logical explanations that could have happened to Louise. Was he a victim of sexual abuse and the perpetrator left him for dead? That could explain a lot of the physical abuse he suffered. Also, it is known that victims of severe abuse sometimes have to propagate a fictional story in order to help deal with the trauma. Still, one troubling fact of this case is that there were no other witnesses who could account for the UFO and the abduction. This is often a problem with sightings and encounters with one eyewitness. From our research, it is not known whether Louise was able to move on from this horrific event or whether he continued to have visitations from the aliens during his adult years. Hello everyone, welcome to the Street of Silence. 
My name is Mark and I'll be your host today. Our channel explores the unknown and looks at a variety of unexplained topics such as UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, and other mysterious phenomena. In this episode, I want to discuss the alien abduction of Linda Napolitano. What makes this story truly unique is the number of independent eyewitnesses who saw the event and could corroborate her story. This case has been has been come to be known as the Brooklyn Bridge Incident. Linda Napolitano was a young woman in her 20s that lived in a high-rise apartment in New York. In April 1989, Napolitano was reading famed ufologist Bud Hopkins' book, Intruders, and remembered that 13 years ago, she had detected a bump next to her nose. She visited a doctor who stated she must have had nasal surgery, but Linda never had nasal surgery. She confirmed that she never had it with her mother as well. Later that year in late November, early December, Napolitano contacted Bud Hopkins and said she had been abducted. The two began multiple hyp hypnosis ses sessions in which the events of that night would be remembered as follows. Napolitano said at 3.15 a.m. she woke up paralyzed and saw three non-human figures. They were gray and had big heads. They were floating in her bedroom. She tried to reach out and call her husband, but the being beings told her to stay quiet. Next, a blue beam hit her and began pulling her through her apartment's window on the 12th floor. Linda lived in Manhattan. Linda said that her and the three other Malians levitated inside the beam until they reached a larger UFO that opened like a clan. Once inside the spaceship, Linda says she saw benches and went down a hallway where the doors slid open. She noticed a table and she hoped that she did not get put on the table. Unfortunately, the aliens placed her on the table and she began screaming as one of the aliens began muttering gibberish, trying to get her to be quiet. The alien eventually put its hand over her mouth so she couldn't scream. Medical procedures would ensue and Linda states that they were so painful she passed out. She recalls them putting something in her nasal cavity. And interestingly, later a doctor would find an unknown device inside her nose. Linda didn't recall much else from the abduction at that point, but remembers waking up in her bed again around three hours later. And again, what makes this case so compelling is the number of independent witnesses. In 1991, two security guards named Richard and Dan sent a letter to famed ufologist Bud Hopkins and stated that there was an oval-shaped object hovering above the apartment building two or three blocks away. They weren't sure where it came from as it came so fast. The lights on the UFO turned from bright reddish to a white bluish from the bottom. Green lights rotated around the bottom. A woman wearing a white gown floated out of her window in the fetal position and then hovered midair in a beam of light. Dan and Richard stated they saw three of the ugliest creatures that they'd ever seen. Their heads were out of proportion, very large, with no hair. Dan and Richard attempted to get out of their car but couldn't. Once Linda went in the spacecraft, the ship turned orange and speeded away. After receiving this letter, Hopkins finally met with the men and learned they were protecting an important political figure. This political figure also witnessed the incident, but he couldn't get a, a specific name of who it was. This is one of the reasons it took so long for them to reach out. They decided to reach out to Hopkins because of guilt. 
Later in 1991, Hopkins received another letter from a woman named Janet Kimball. She also said she had witnessed the event. She stated at 3 a.m. that morning, she was driving over the Brooklyn Bridge when suddenly all the car lights and engines shut off. Streetlights went out as well. Drivers then exited the car to see what was happening and saw the woman floating above her apartment, about 12 stories, and then going into a UFO. Later, a third man approached Hopkins stating he had witnessed the events, but he could not publicly come forward for fear of repercussion. It is believed that this was Javier Perez de Cuerla, the Secretary General of the United Nations, and this is the man that Richard and Dan were protecting that day. Further evidence supporting the story includes a metallic object that was discovered inside Linda's nose during a routine exam. It is believed that this was some sort of alien implant. Several weeks after this was found, Linda had a serious nosebleed that occurred during the night. An X-ray would soon reveal that a metallic object was no longer present, but the X-ray also showed a conspicuous ridge conspicuous ridge of built-up cartilage where it's believed to have once been. Hopkins suspected that the aliens had placed the object in her nose, and when they realized Linda might try to have it removed, the aliens extracted it for fear that we might get a hold of their technology. With almost every UFO and alien story, questions begin to arise from skeptics. For example, many question whether Dan and Richard really exist. Also, they ponder why it took them so long to contact Hopkins. One other thing that skeptics point out is that Napolitano was an avid UFO fan before her abduction. She attended talks by Hopkins and read books on aliens, such as Intruders. It is generally agreed upon that if this event had happened today over, over the Brooklyn Bridge, evidence would almost certainly exist. In the age where almost everyone has a cell phone camera, with dozens of witnesses, someone would have likely snapped a picture. In addition, many buildings have multiple cameras, as well as various tracking devices by the city. It could be possible that the aliens could cripple the electronic systems, but the sheer number of independent witnesses corroborating the same story would be solid proof. Thank you for your time and listening. If you enjoyed this content, please consider subscribing to the channel, and we always welcome feedback and new story suggestions.